First thing I want to do is take attendance. I hope everyone had a restful holiday weekend. It was too short, but it was at least something. I think the next holiday isn't until December. So hopefully we got the rest we need to get us to December. I want to take attendance. I haven't had an opportunity to review your, your submission, the, um, the bad news communication letters, but I will. And I'm going to get feedback to you by Friday. I traveled on the weekend, so I'm still trying to get caught up and back on schedule. Okay, here we go. Now I'm not going to be able to share my video with you for much longer. I have had to hotspot and I have a lot of videos to share with you as we talk about persuasive writing. And that's going to just eat through my data. So I'm going to try to conserve where I can. But so very soon I'm going to have to disconnect my video. Um, but hopefully you're still able to pay attention. You're not just, you'll, you'll be looking at videos and different um, materials that I share. So you won't be just looking at a blank screen. Natasha, Augustine. Present. Renee Payne. Yeah. Tanishka, Tanishka Cobra. Hey, I'm present. Helga Cummings. Present. Mikhail Nabi. Edrika McKinsey. Edrika. Jules Macedola. No, Jules. Felicia Pratt. Present. Janice Rowe. Present. Danara Strong. Danara. Helena Stura. Denise Thompson. Now, it was somebody last week who had not been assigned to a group. And I said that I would put you in a group this week. Was that you, Natasha? It was me, Tanishka. Tanishka. OK, Tanishka, it looks like you will have to form a group of three with Helga and um, Jules. OK. OK? Yes. All right. Let me save this. Today is October 14th. All right, before we start, do you have any questions for me? about anything that we, the light is bad. Well, in any case, I'm about to stop my video. Do you have any questions for me about anything that we've discussed thus far? There are six of you in the meeting. Uh, we're gonna do some group exercises. I'm gonna put you into groups of two, uh, and that is unless somebody else joins the meeting and then we may have different group composition, but that's not until later. Any questions for me? All right, so bear with me. Let me mute. Make sure everyone's mic is muted. All right, so if you had a chance to look at the syllabus, you'll see that we are discussing persuasive writing. 
That will be our focus this evening, but I wanna discuss persuasive writing in two aspects. So we are going to talk about persuasion um, and the writing conventions that you need to observe when you are trying to persuade um, somebody else to take action, somebody else to endorse a product, somebody else to um, follow a particular path, whatever that is that you may want them to do. And then we're also gonna look at how our grammar mechanics and the conventions of writing impact the way people perceive us. We want to persuade them to see us in a particular way as well. So we're gonna talk about how the writing conventions impact our level of persuasion. And then we're gonna look at persuasion in business from a different standpoint through advertising and marketing, how we strategize or how advertisers and marketers strategize to meet customers' needs and get them to um, take action. And so you will have an assignment to do, which you will start tonight and submit next week. It's gonna require some planning and some work on your part. So we're gonna begin our work on it tonight. You will be assigned a partner. It is a bit of a work. It's not necessarily going to be something quick and easy. It's going to take some time and planning. And so to ease some of the burden that you will have to take on, I'm gonna put you into groups to complete the assignment, okay? All right, so for the past, the past four weeks, we've been talking about clarity and flow, emphasizing the importance of those elements in our writing. When we talk about effective writing though, that also involves the art of persuasion, as I just said. And so we need to first understand what persuasion means. As I go through, just raise your hand if you have questions or make notes of any point that you deem to be important. That is the question that we need to think about. What is persuasion? So some of the more obvious answers or thoughts come to mind. It, we, we want to get the reader to change his or her mind. We want them to take action. Um, in writing though, we also want them to see us as competent and professional. We also want them to see us as intelligent. And so the idea behind persuasion is to get readers or our audience to make the appropriate judgments about us and about the company or organization we work for based on the written documents that we generate. I'll say that again. An element of persuasion, a very important component of persuasion is to get readers to make the appropriate judgments about us and about the company or the organization we work for based on the written documents we generate. We want them to see us as professional, we want them to see us as intelligent. We want them to see us as competent because whether or not we want to face this reality, we make judgments about others, about their level of intelligence, about their competence in business on the basis of their writing. So we say things like, well, geez, they can't even put together a decent letter or they can't um, fulfill a customer request or interpret a customer request communicated in writing. So I don't need to do business with those people. Um, or we've written, read something that's been written by a company or an individual, and we think that they're incompetent and not professional. Um, whether it's someone we work with or someone we have to interact with in business in another sphere. Um, and so it means that our writing represents us. Um, more so than the ideas we communicate, the errors that creep into our writing send messages as well that we need to be aware of. So what are some strategies that writers use to produce effective persuasive writing? What are some of the things that we need to keep in mind? The first thing is, and I've said this before, so it should sound somewhat familiar to you, you need to think about your audience. So what is it that your audience needs and what do they want from this communication? So we need to know who that audience member, who our audience is. We need to think about our, their background, their age, their gender, their race, um, their role within the organization. Are they the decision maker, for instance? If we want this company that we are writing persuasively to, to take a particular action, are we addressing our correspondence to the correct person? And then we think about their demographics. We also need to think about the tolerance our audience may or may not have for the message we're sending. Is this gonna be good news? Is this gonna be bad news? 
Uh, is this person super busy? Understanding those kinds of things make it possible for us to create messages that our audience will find most useful. Um, and so the first thing, key thing, think about our audience, know who they are and know what they need from this communication. Um, also keep in mind that our audience members may have a certain hostility to reading. Um, more and more today, and we talked about some of the things that prevent us from listening. Sorry, I had to mute Anishka. We talked about some of the things that prevent us from listening. Uh, those are also things that prevent us from reading as well, or that create this kind of hostility. We're too busy, we're inundated with information. Most readers are considered illiterate, not ILL, meaning they can't read, but illiterate, A-L-I-T-E-R-A-T-E, -E, meaning they can read, but they prefer not to, or they choose not to. Or they will not sit and read a document from beginning to end in one sitting. So we need to understand the tolerance of our audience and understand that illiteracy um, is a factor that we need to keep in mind. If we know that the attention span of the average person in our audience is shorter, then the documents we create probably need to be shorter and more, more user-friendly. So we need to make use of things like headings and subheadings so that the information kind of jumps out at the audience. And then we have these divisions in terms of what is important and what is not important. And then if we're communicating something that our audience may not receive well, then we can use more positive language to create a kind of feeling of goodwill. Um, in our reader as they're reading. But one of the most important things in persuasive writing is getting our audience members to buy in. So what does buy in mean? That means that we essentially need to look at whatever we are communicating in that persuasive piece as an argument. Now it's not an argument in the sense that we traditionally understand an argument where you have differences of opinion and you know the temperatures rise and tempers flare and emotions are high. No, it's not an argument in that sense, but what you are doing is trying to persuade your audience members to take a particular action. So you are advocating a particular stance, a particular position that you want them to adopt and you need them to buy into that position, i.e. take the action you want them to take. Uh, one way to do that, one way to get them to successfully buy in is to try to identify with our audience. Um, the term identification means making the reader believe that you have their best interests at heart. You are very concerned about them and you have their best interests at heart. Now, let me ask you a question. How many of you saw the communication from Royal Bank today? about interest, them not paying interest. I did. I saw, and I it. saw it. Okay, so that wasn't exactly a persuasive piece, but that is an example of communication that is going to be received in a particular way by our audience. So tell me, based on your reading it, those of you who saw it, what message does that communication send to customers of Royal Bank, about Royal Bank? Well, to me, that sense that they plan on pulling out someone like, you know, and they really, they're not really concerned about their customers. They just concern about whatever they say have going on and not necessarily their customers' needs. So it comes across as not being concerned and we could couple that with, some of the other decisions we've seen from that, from that bank in particular, right? Uh, and people have been speculating, what are they leaving the market? What's happening? Um, but it does not prove to be very customer-centered in its approach. And it's offensive to the intelligent person because essentially, here's what Royal Bank is saying. You maintain your deposit accounts with us we are no longer going to pay you interest on these deposit accounts. 
Um, and then there was one, um, one line where it says, and fixed deposits will be, um, will generate a zero interest rate as though that is zero interest rate is somehow some kind of interest rate, right? Um, but it comes across as one we said not client centered, but the message is deposit with us, even though there's nothing in it for you. So you generate zero interest on your deposit. Um, we will lend that money out, earn interest on, on the loan, uh, lend it to you if you meet our criteria, all right? Um, but you get nothing in return. And for the joy of maintaining your deposit accounts with RBC, we will charge you um, fees whatever client fees the bank generally assesses. And so that's the message, not customer centered, not customer friendly, not customer focused, just this is what it is. Um, it is a smart business decision for RBC, but any consumer who got that message had to be thinking about why they need to go to RBC and close their accounts tomorrow. And then of course we think, is that what they want us to do? Yeah, they're probably trying to recoup whatever losses they've incurred, uh, through delinquency over the last 18 months due to COVID, but is that the best policy um, to address your needs and also the needs of the customers? Um, so there's there's probably going to be little or no customer buy-in um, for something like that, unless the subtext of that text or that message is close your accounts because deposit account savings accounts are no longer profitable for us. Um, and we, in fact, may be thinking about leaving the market, then, yeah, they may get customers to buy into something like that. Um, all right. And so we need to, another thing after getting customers to buy in, we need to consider our purpose. So what is our goal in producing this document? What do we need our document to accomplish? Do we want our audience members to make a decision? Do we want them to perform a particular action? Do we want them to pass this document to some, on to someone else? Are we simply explaining an idea to them? We need to be able to articulate the goal of our writing uh, and, and know the strategies to best meet that goal. And then if we have a solid purpose in mind, we need to know why our readers are reading. What is it that they are supposed to get from this document? And is their intent going to be different from your intent? All right. So those strategies are key for effective persuasive writing. Know your audience. Know why they're reading your document. Know what their objective is. Know what your objective is. Um, know how they may respond to your message. Know what their tolerance level is. Understand that most people are illiterate. They can read, but they choose not to read. Um, and then you want your audience members to buy in. That is to take that particular step that you are advocating in that message. And so in order to do that, you need to avoid certain things. So avoid excessive verbiage. The message can be too long. You can't take too long to get to the point. Uh, your language doesn't need to be overly flowery or ornate. That's gonna make you sound just pedantic and out of touch. And another thing is avoid jargon. That's closely related to the ornate language or long technical explanations. Um, if you work in a particular field, you want to avoid using overly technical language that's not understood by your audience or members of the general public. You want, if you're a lawyer, for instance, too much legalese in, in a document that's meant for not another lawyer, but for a client who has no legal background is not gonna be effective communication. All right, so you have to know your audience in that way, know what their skill level is, um, and know what their capacity to understand may be. Now, you don't want to make assumptions about people's intelligence levels in a negative way, like this person seems a little bit slow, let me dumb it down. No, you don't want to ins be insulting in that way, but you do need to be aware that certain language is particular to a certain discipline and not necessarily. Uh, known to or understood by members of the general public. And so you want to avoid overly technical, ornate language or jargon. And then most importantly, avoid grammar and mechanical errors. Um, 
Chapter four in your course text discusses common grammar and mechanical errors. I'm gonna just briefly share something with you that I'm gonna email after class. One second, let me find it. Okay. So I'm emailing this document to you after class. This is meant to kind of give you a quick review of chapter four in your text. These are the kinds of mechanical issues that reflect poorly on us as writers, the kinds of things that we want to avoid, semicolons, out of place, wrong punctuation. We've talked about uses of the comma early in the class. Now we're adding uses of the semicolon and colon to this. Um, how to avoid sentence fragments. A fragment is a piece of a sentence, not a complete sentence. A basic understanding of English grammar is that a sentence conveys a complete thought or idea. Said another way, a sentence can stand alone and make sense. It, com it conveys something that is complete and makes sense on its own. So anytime you have a sentence fragment, you have something that doesn't make sense on its own. You have a piece of a sentence. Uh, how do we avoid them? Uh, how do we avoid comma splices? When you encounter a comma splice it, or you use a comma splice, it means you have a comma where you need another punctuation mark, like a period. So using a comma to separate two sentences, for instance. Um, or, and that is very much like a run-on sentence, which has multiple sentences combined with no punctuation at all, not even a comma. Um, and so these are some common, and again, we're gonna add to our grammar and mechanics list, but I'm gonna email this to you at the end of the lesson. Um, and also ask that you review chapter four and implement some of these strategies into your writing, some of these rules into your writing. Uh, we're not gonna go through these in any detail, uh, but I do want you to read them. And then the chapter, the chapter information in chapter four is meant to supplement. Okay, so look out for this from me, um, rules and some examples. And of course, you want to review chapter four. Okay. Your mic is unmuted, you have a question? Okay, all right. So those kinds of errors reflect poorly on us as writers. And so we want to avoid that. Um, essentially, or in a nutshell, our goal in persuasive writing, no matter what organization we, we work for, is to produce something that's easy to read um, and that presents a good impression of us as writers uh, and that gets our audience members to take the desired action or to use the information in the way that we as the writer intend them to use, right? As I said, the basics of communication and writing remain the same, no matter if we're communicating bad news, if we're communicating to persuade, we need to be aware of those conventions. And so for the last five, six weeks, however many weeks we've been meeting, I think this is week five, I've been emphasizing uh, the same strategies to approach writing, correctness, flow, uh, um, an audience-centered approach. Um, and now we're gonna take a break from some of that and we're gonna look at how we persuade um, in a different way in business. Persuasive, persuasive writing and advertising in particular. But first we need to understand a little bit about human behavior and what motivates human behavior. And so we're gonna get into a little bit of psychology tonight um, and talk about Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which divides human needs and motivations into different tiers. Anybody studied psychology? Anybody? been introduced to Maslow before? I haven't studied psychology, but I was introduced to Maslow. 
the floor. Okay, Tanishka. So where were you introduced to Maslow? Um, in a course prior to this, supervisory skills. Okay, excellent. And so it's an important management strategy. You need to know what motivates your employees to work. Um, what is it that um, sort of governs human behavior if you're going to be effective managers? But it's also important if you're going to be effective communicators, specifically communicate to persuade, right? So I'm gonna share Maslow's hierarchy with you. So you'll be looking at a pyramid for the next few minutes or so. One second, I didn't open the document. Mm. Sorry, it's not allowing me to share it. One second. There we go. Okay, so I don't wanna cut this. Let me try to make this smaller so that it appears on the screen. Oh goodness, I'm moving it down. I don't want to scrunch. I don't want to make it too small so that you can't see it. But I want you to be able to see the entire pyramid. Does that work? Can you see? Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. So you're looking at a pyramid created by Abraham Maslow, providing human needs. Sorry, let me just mute the person. We're getting some feedback. I want you to study this pyramid for a second and notice the way the needs are categorized or divided. Now, this is a pyramid. And so we're moving from the bottom to the top, right? In terms of value and importance. Okay, so. What does this have to do with advertising? In business, almost every ad that we look at, whether it's a print, say in a magazine or a newspaper, or a visual ad, a commercial on television, for instance, almost every ad is created with the same intent or the same goal. They want to persuade the audience to trust the brand. How they create or spin the concept around that intent is what makes the difference, right? Um, this pyramid or Maslow's hierarchy of needs is based on the work of a well-known, sorry, I'm trying to mute. Tanishka, I think that's you. Can you mute your mic, please? I okay. can't get back to the screen to mute you. It's based on the work of a well-known um, behavioral theorist. Um, who talks about management, um, successful management and human behavior uh, in management. So Abraham Maslow was a psychologist and he proposed this theory of, of motivation and it's based on universal human needs. He believed that each individual has a hierarchy of needs and these needs consist of psychological. So we see the psychological needs at the bottom safety needs, um, social, esteem, 
um, self-actualization needs. The self-actualization needs are the more higher order needs that we see at the top of the pyramid. These relate to on-the-job performance and motivation because Maslow theorized that people act in such a way to satisfy their unmet needs. So when you're hungry, for instance, you, 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 you eat food, right? That's basic. Um, that is a physiological need. We need food, we need water, we need warmth, we need rest. Those are the things that we need to survive. Once a need is satisfied, according to Maslow, it's important to the individual is diminished. So we may think, and we, we say it all the time, Lord, I'm so hungry, I can eat a cow. Um, and then we eat a meal, and we don't think about food anymore until we become hungry again. And the fact that these needs kind of repeat themselves is a particular weakness in Maslow's theory, or the fact that we move down the pyramid and move up the pyramid at different times in our lives, at different times during the day, uh, is another weakness in the theory. But it does not mean that this particular um, way of, of looking at human behavior doesn't have its value or relevance. So as I said, he believed that once a need is satisfied, its importance diminishes and a higher level need is more likely to motivate us, right? Once we've met our basic needs. Um, so in large part, these physiological needs that we see at the bottom, they are the things that motivate us, for instance, to find a job because we need food, we need water, um, we need shelter, we need a comfortable bed. We need, we earn money to provide these things for ourselves. Once we've met these needs and we move on to the second order of needs, our safety needs. Um, we need to feel protected from physical harm. Um, we need to feel that we can avoid the unexpected. So we need security. The job might provide that as well, but we make decisions regarding employment based on the degree of security provided as well, all right? We may leave one job for another for better benefits. If there is a better insurance package at another job, if the other job pays more money that will allow us to better take care of our family members, then we move from one job uh, to the other. Um, if a job is too dangerous or too hazardous, it may violate our need for safety. And so we move on from that job. Physiological needs and safety needs, those are our physical needs. Those are our basic needs. Once those needs are satisfied, then it frees our mind up to focus on the needs that involve relationships, the way we relate to other people. So at Maslow's third level, we have our social needs, the need to belong, uh, to feel accepted by others. Um, to give and to receive friendships. Um, on the job, our social groups, our informal social groups, both on and off the job, as a matter of fact, they satisfy these basic needs. Um, sorry, these, those psychological needs. They're not basic anymore. At the fourth level of this hierarchy are our esteem needs. They are the needs that we have to feel respected by others. Um, to feel that we have accomplished something great, to feel that we have achieved something with our lives. Uh, we've achieved something with the week, right? We haven't just wasted our time. Once we satisfy those needs, then it improves our feelings of self-worth. Um, once we get praise and recognition from our managers and others in the firm, then we feel a greater sense of, of self-worth. We feel a greater sense of personal efficacy. Um, and then at the highest level, Beyond those esteem needs, there are self-actualization needs or our needs for fulfillment. We need to feel like we're living up to our full potential. Uh, we're not stuck in the same job, performing at the same level without being promoted. Um, we are not still earning um, what is not enough to take care of ourselves and our family. Close to retirement age, we may begin to worry about whether we've lived up to our full potential um, in this life and whether we've used our abilities to the utmost. So these are human needs in a nutshell. Um, what does this have to do with advertising though? Advertisers have figured out 
that if they want to persuade us, they need to help us see how these needs can be met by whatever product they're selling. What does this have to do with business? Another way, looking at it another way, businesses who are employee focused and employee centered have figured out that if they could create an organization that meets these needs of employees, they will reduce turnover, improve employee satisfaction and improve productivity at the same time and profit for the business at the same time. So there is a well-known and very famous example of a chain of grocery stores in the US called Wegmans. Now, when you think about grocery store, um, it's not necessarily some, some place that we think of as being a great place to work. Employee turnover is high, the hours are long, um, the salary is generally quite low. Um, and so for many people, it's not the first choice of a job. But Wegmans, this chain of grocery store, continues to, and I think they have like 100, 106, 106 that's the number, uh, 106 locations across the US, right? They have managed to find their way on Fortune 500's best companies to work for every year since Fortune started this list. So every year for the last 20 years, this chain of grocery stores has made the list. And so that led people to start to examine their model. What are they doing right? Um, because traditionally, the grocery store is not seen as the place to work. So researchers came up with the answer after studying the company model. So what makes Wegmans a success? The company shows attention to its employees at every level. So number one, their wages are far above market. Um, for a grocery store. And until 2003, they paid 100% of their employees' medical insurance insurance premium. So what, what, what human needs are they meeting with above market wages and free insurance yeah. until 2003? Safety. Safety, security, the basic mm -hmm. needs. If you pay people better, they could buy food. They could buy water. They could meet their physiological needs. You take care of their insurance, they feel more secure. And so they stay. Um, what else are they doing? More than half the um, store managers started working in their teens. They began working there as teens and continued, but they feel as though they are a part of a culture. They feel as though they are a part of uh, a body and environment. And so you get belongingness and love. It's not just a job because people have been there for so long, they become like family. Um, and then they're investing in their employees. So they've given $54 million for college scholarships. Um, almost 20,000 full-time and part-time employees have benefited from this over the last 20 years. Uh, they send employers on training to places, to far off places like London, Paris, Italy, they're investing in their employees and that in turn creates a feeling of one, belongingness, but esteem. There's a certain prestige uh, in these places. There's a certain prestige in the training that they are receiving, but it's also about investing in employees and helping them to reach their full potential. So you get self-actualization needs as well. So what they're doing is paying attention to this hierarchy and trying to tap into those customers' needs at every step. Um, and the result has been positive for them. Um, when we look at advertising, not, not so much the business structure, when we, when we move from this hierarchy in terms of management to how advertisers use them, we think of some of the more common slogans we've heard, right? over the years. I'm going to share the second page of this slide with you. And you see the hierarchy again, but as it relates to advertising and some key slogans that we've seen over the years from the US Army, from the Pepsi, and we're going to look at a Pepsi ad in a minute, Allstate Insurance, where on the pyramid 
do these slogans fit? What need are they tapping into? How are they targeting customers and getting them to buy in to what they're selling by making them feel like if you take the prescribed action, if you buy the particular product, then it will meet these particular needs, right? And so we're constantly <clears throat> being bombarded with these kinds of advertisers, advertisement stories and offers and calls to action. And so we're gonna look at these strategies in print ads and in magazine ads. And you may wonder, well, why is mistakes going over all of this? Because you are going to have to do a similar assignment where you create a product and try to market it. And you're gonna begin working on that this week and present what you come up with next week, all right? So let's see what um, advertisers have done. Let's examine some um, effective print and magazine ads to see I want you to jot down the three points you're looking for. So what product is being sold? Hang on, I'm gonna pull it up. I actually have it typed out. So I'm gonna pull it up. Okay. So persuasive marketing. So I want you to try to describe the ad. Who is the target audience for this ad? What is the objective of this advertisement or what action does it want its target audience to take? And what techniques are used to connect with the audience and to persuade them to take the desired action, All right? So I'm going to send this to you. We're going to do the first one together. And then I'm going to put you into groups to work on the others for about 15 minutes or so. And then we come back to our meeting and you tell me what you came up with. And then we're going to look at some videos before we get into the assignment that I want you to complete. Okay. Are we all on the same page so far? Yes. Okay. Yes. yes. All right. So let me stop this share. I'm gonna pull up magazine ad number one. There are four magazine ads. So once we've done this one, there will be three for you to examine. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven of you. All right, seven of you in the meeting. Okay, Denise, you came in, remind me to update um, the attendance roster at the end of the lesson. Yes, ma'am. Okay, so you should be looking at a Gucci ad. Is everyone looking at the same thing? Yes. All right, great. And so we know that they're selling perfume. What about this ad is appealing? Does it meet a particular need? How are we being persuaded to, to buy this Gucci perfume? Even if as women, we don't buy it for ourselves, we go out and buy it for men. The interesting thing is even in not an ad like this, where the, the product may be targeted to a male audience um, or feature a male model, the target audience is not necessarily male because men are not the ones that do the most shopping women. So what strategies are being used to get us to focus on this ad and then go and buy Gucci for men too? I think the, uh, the picture they use, uh, the model. Okay, what about him? He's nice looking. <laughs> He's attractive. Mm -hmm. what, what are you drawn to when you look at this ad? Yes, nice. his attractive face, but eyes. His, his eyes. His eyes. His eyes. And so this gaze, this um, level, straightforward gaze is meant to suggest a certain openness and honesty that draws us in. And the color is mm -hmm. not accidental either because the yeah. color mirrors what? The bottle. The, the bottle. The bottle. 
Exactly. So the most attractive part of this ad is, or the attractive part of this man is perhaps the eyes, and that is mirrored in, in, in the Gucci perfume, right? Um, why, do, why do they use attractive people to begin with? To entice you. <laughs> to entice you. Um, mm -hmm. It's visually appealing. Right. But we right. respond. We respond based on our own need or desire to feel attractive, our mm -hmm. own esteem needs, and so a part of that desire for attractiveness is also wanting to smell good, right? Um, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna say it, but he's exuding something else that women are going to find appealing. Remember, we said this is about a man. Uh, this ad, um, sorry, features a man, but it's not necessarily targeted to a man. It's targeted to women who will go out and buy this perfume for their spouse. Why do I say that? He's exuding something else that women sex are going to feel. Sex appeal. He's very sexy. Beyond being just good looking, because some good pe looking people are just blah, you know, but he's very, look at the pose. And look at the fact that his shirt is open. This is about sex appeal and women wanting men who are sexy and appealing. Now, mm -hmm. I'm not saying that men will not necessarily see this ad and go and buy this perfume because they too want to be appealing and sexy to women. But marketers more often than not market products to the shoppers. And we know that the shoppers are women. Uh, is there anything else about this ad that is appealing and that draws our, our eye in or our attention? What about color, apart from the eye? What feeling do you get from the colors used? Richness, like gold. You said gold? Yeah. No, grit, richness, like a sense of wealth. Okay, so luxury, yes. Yeah, it's luxury. understated and it's elegant. The colors are not glaring, they're not loud. They're not screaming at us. It's understated, and that suggests class. The mm -hmm. goal of the Gucci, the goal of the top, um, and then against this white backdrop, it also causes him to pop out at us, right? Mm -hmm. um, and the focus is on him. And so all in all, this ad appeals to our need to feel attractive, our esteem needs. Um, we want to feel as though... Um, we are attractive to members of the opposite sex. We want that as a, as a woman, we want the man in our life to exude this kind of sex appeal. And so we may go out and buy this, this fragrance, right? And so that's the message of this ad. Go and, and buy this perfume. In terms of the strategies that they're using, the attractive model, the use of color, the composition of the ad, the direct gaze to suggest honesty and openness. And then of course the, the blatant sex appeal. Good. So do you kind of get a feel for what we're doing? Yes. Okay, now some of you may be thinking, I know Ms. Hicks does not expect for me to come up with an ad like this. No, what I want you to do at the end of the night, not right now, I'm just gonna put your mind at ease for a little bit. I want you to think of a product that will meet a need and devise a way to market it to persuade people to buy that product. So that's where the persuasive writing assignment is gonna come in. I don't expect you to have a magazine ad like this or anything, but you're gonna use particular strategies and thinking about how to sell this product, who your target audience is and how you're gonna reach them, okay? All right, so I'm gonna put you into breakout groups of, um, So one group will have three and two groups will have two students. And I want you to examine the ad. I'm going to tell you which groups you're in and which ad you're responsible for because I'm going to email all the ads. All right. So it's it's six of us. There are only six now, two, four, you six, said three, I think two. seven. Oh, okay. No, I think seven. Said three and two. Three, no, I'm saying three groups. One group will have three and two groups will have oh, two. Oh, three two. groups, okay. Yeah, so three groups. Okay. Um, all right, so let me create the breakout rooms first. Actually, no, that's gonna, that's gonna take me into another um, menu in Zoom. So let's not do that. 
All right, so let me share ad number two with you. I also want you to think about as you're examining these ads, and this becomes particularly important when we look at ad number two about culture and how the, the messages have changed over time. What's appropriate and inappropriate has changed over time. So group two is responsible for ad two, the coffee ad. Okay, um, group three, you'll know which group you're in in a minute, but just make note. Group three is responsible for the FP, SPF, the sunblock ad. So this is group three. And group four is responsible for ad number four, which is the Coca-Cola ad. This one. All right, so now for the breakout rooms. So in room one, well, you're, you're, you're responsible for ad number two, Janice, Natasha, and Tanishka. You're responsible for ad number two, Denise Thompson, Helga Cummings, you're responsible for ad number three, Bernique Bain and Felicia are responsible for ad number four, which is the Coca-Cola ad. So ad number two is the sunblock, ad number number. Sorry, ad number number two is the coffee ad. Ad number three is the sunblock. Ad number four is the Coca-Cola. We did ad number one together. Okay, so I'm going to open the rooms and I'm going to email those three ads to, to each student. You have 15 minutes. I'm going to stop you at about 7.13, 7.14 or so. Give you a little bit extra time. And I'm also gonna send the list of questions you're asking as you examine the app.
Okay, we only have three students in the meeting. Uh, Helga and Denise, Renee and Felicia seem to need more time. So let's give them a minute. Okay, they're joining us now. All right, I'm gonna pull up on screen magazine ad number two. It's just this very shocking ad. Mm -hmm. So remind me who was assigned to room two again? Natasha, Janice, and Tanishka. Okay, all right. So what did you determine about this ad? Okay, we described the ad as um, a wife, I guess, being chastised because she probably didn't purchase um, fresh coffee. Yes. Um, Is she only being chastised? Um, right. no. <laughs> She's being punished. Mm -hmm. She's being punished for not bringing on fresh coffee. Mm -hmm. um, the audience that's being targeted, I would say a more senior audience, preferably married couples, coffee drinkers. Mm -hmm. um, let me see the next question. What is the objective? Mm -hmm. The objective is to purchase fresh coffee okay or the consequence the consequences you will face if you don't okay so they use fair to motivate the audience right yeah um and so this is an ad that's meant to satisfy a basic need for food right because coffee is something that we consume mm -hmm. would an ad like this work for an audience today um no, no not, not so much. Probably not really not. Coffee drinkers or no way. This wouldn't. <laughs> the, this is shocking and offensive today. This might yes. have been humorous in the fifties mm -hmm. or forties or whenever this ad first um, premiered. But this is offensive today. The fact that a husband would be disciplining his wife. And put, think about how far we've come as a society. Uh, depending on where you are, people would be shocked to see a parent disciplining a child like this. Yeah. Um, and so this is offensive, but we think about not only uh, the needs of our audience, but the values of our audience. And so let's say this ad premiered in the 50s, the values of what was considered appropriate behavior in the 50s is entirely different from what's considered appropriate behavior today. Do you agree? Or culturally acceptable today? I agree. 100%. So we might be shocked by this, but not necessarily when this ad first premiered. Um, is this appealing? Is it anything visually appealing? No, ma'am. No, not at all. It's very flat. It's very um, unengaging. And this is a testament to how far uh, ads have come and how much our understanding of human behavior uh, has evolved, right? Okay, good. So any other thing you want to add um, about ad number two? Um, Even the packaging is not very appealing, right? You, you only problem. understand what the ad is really about because you read what's on the side. Right. Uh, and how have audiences changed today? We're more visual, right? Yeah. So yes, this image of the woman being spanked by her husband is going to draw us in, but we're not going to read all this long verbiage on the side. The average person is not. And so they use um, uh, more graphics, more appealing visuals, color, and things like that to, to draw us in and to grab our attention. Okay, so let me stop this share. Let's look at ad number three. And when we look at this, 
we see the difference between There's strategies used to appeal to consumers okay, 60 yeah. years ago and today. So this is visually appealing, right? Let's hear from the members of group three. Okay, um, what we um, observe in looking at this ad was that it set the tone for the outdoors and also summer vacation, um, enjoying time with family just by the background. Um, it's clearly something for the outdoors. And when you think of outdoors, you think of warm weather, mm -hmm. tropical setting, going to the beach. And um, the way the brand is packaged, it's very luxurious. It looks of quality. Mm -hmm. And also because of the green color that they use, it's a unisex color. So this mm -hmm. can be um, used by male or female. Mm -hmm. um, but I, but we both agreed that we feel like this particular ad is targeting women mm -hmm. because of the way it's packaged, because of the um, different points that they highlighted. Um, and also persons that are illiterate, it got mm -hmm. straight to the point mm -hmm. by just um, quoting just several things like lightweight formula, no added oils, non pore clogging. So, so what, do we have, what do we have to draw attention? We have these bulleted points. We don't have a whole lot of verbiage, right? Just right. bulleted points and that most essential information, good. And then look at the font too, Helga. Yes. Can you repeat that? I said, what about the font? What would you say about the font? About the? Font, F-O-N-T. Um, the, the font basically is inclusive of everyone, those young and old. Um, oh, I mean, everybody, the everybody size of the letters and the different fonts used. So everybody can see it. Yes, everybody, good. Okay. Everybody, yeah, so it includes young and old. Yes, and the things that they want to jump out at us stand, stand right. up because of the larger font. The fact that it's SPF 50. Um, it's a sunscreen, it's a spray, and it's also targeting a particular kind of consumer, someone who doesn't have time for oily sun, sun low, sunblock, uh, you want something lightweight, you want something that's not going to clog your pores, but this is for somebody who is more active, and Helga said that the green is unisex, but we associate green with what? Outdoors. Outdoors, health, vitality, right? Um, so it's the color of nature. And it's a very appealing and very uh, inviting ad. The composition, the product seems to be coming off the page at us. Um, and we have different hues of green. And this is not quite white. It's almost a silvery yeah. um, color. And they blend really well together, right? Um, but we do think of tropical, and that's what these palms are meant to suggest. Tropical weather, so that's when you need sunscreen and sun protection the most uh, for this extreme Bahamian heat. Right. <laughs> All right, excellent. So this is an example of a very appealing ad. Um, let's look at the final one. We know the message is go out and buy the sunscreen. Uh, I routinely use sunscreen and I want to go and find that. I've never seen that product. I've never seen that product, but I, I want to go in and find it because it looks like it does a good job. It looks like it does exactly what the label says. Yes, and it's SPF 50, um, which is technically for older people but the more sun protection, the better. All right, so this Coca-Cola ad. Now, when I first saw this, it took me a minute to realize what this was saying at the top. I saw a little clearly, but I couldn't make out the other words. Uh, who's responsible for this ad? Um, Bernique and Felicia. Okay, Bernique and Felicia. So... Um, you are gonna say something? No, I was gonna say, so what did you come up with? Okay, so I want to short and sweet. Okay. So we, we, 
we realized that this is targeted towards, you know, an audience that maybe maybe someone who's working in the sun all day, like a construction worker. Mm-hmm. Um, and, you know, it motivates them to, like, after working in the hot sun all day, pop this Coke as a little refresher. You think so? You think a construction worker? Yeah, they're in the sun and, you know, this berry and it cold. Somebody who in the sun and it worked what are they gonna want after a long day? A bear. A bear. <laughs> okay, all right. But this seems more feminine different. to me. This raspberry yeah. and the colors uh, and the curly. I guys. guess, but I was just we was just thinking about you know it being cool and refreshing for uh-huh. somebody who's been in the sun all day. They may want a refreshing drink, a cool okay. refreshing. Okay. Yeah. We didn't really look at the pink. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, but that's a good. That's a good point because of the colors. Okay, so yeah, well, our last point would have been, yeah, the bright colors and the slogan, a little while, would um, persuade the audience to, you know, have a drink and loosen up a little, let their hair down. Okay, all right, good. Um, this is definitely an ad that appeals to women. And we talked about the use of the color, but why else did I say that? Raspberry flavor, yeah. The raspberry yeah. flavor, the pretty and flowers, flowers and the ladybugs. Yeah. Even the, the curse of writing. The curse yeah. of writing. It, is, it what. is what we call a pretty ad. Right. Yeah. And it's more, yeah. it's more of, of, of a feminine ad or meant to appeal to a woman. And just in case, on the side of the regular Coke is the raspberry diet Coke for women who are always on the diet and trying to lose the stubborn 10 pounds. All right. Even the color composition is inviting. The flowers are silver against this shocking red backdrop. It's a very visually stimulating and appealing ad. It's definitely geared toward more of the female um, member of the sex, not necessarily the male. But yeah, somebody who, and, and, and I think that was Bernique who was answering, somebody who wants a cool drink. Now, what could they have done? to make this even more inviting. And maybe some people would say this was overkill. How do you make it look even colder? We need some put droplets. Some they could put some water, water droplets, yeah. make it look like it was cold. Mm-hmm. That's it. Yeah, but this is more about the sleek and the feminine. Look at even the shape of the bottle, which Coca-Cola has maintained over the years, right? Okay, now let's look at ads and on TV commercials and see what they've been able to do to draw us in and to persuade us using some very sneaky strategies um, that a lot of us don't even realize. For instance, and I think about this every time because I I kind of, with my students, we get into um, fallacious reasoning and audience appeals, um, appeals to ethos, logos, and pathos. So the kinds of rhetorical strategies that speakers use but also the kinds of rhetorical strategies that arguers use as well and how they play into advertising. And it's interesting when we think about even the composition of items on the shelf in a grocery store have a lot to do with human needs and motivation. Um, If you go to um, some grocery stores, you'll see that the higher, the Items that are higher up on the shelf are more difficult to reach are not the ones that are commonly bought. But the the commonly bought items are usually at eye level. When you go to um, the checkout counter and you wanna ring up your items, all alongside you are the impulse bars. So you have a magazine, you have candy bars. Those are the things that your children are gonna reach for or you are gonna reach for on an impulse, right? Before you leave the store. Um, When you go home in the evening, what are you going to see on the television set between 5 and 8 p.m.? You're going to see food ads. What are you going to hear on the radio? Food ads. Why? Because that's dinner time. You're getting all of these subliminal messages uh, and all these encoded signals about what to eat and when. Um, And so let's look at some of these messages in print. Well, we just looked at print ads in magazine, video ads, visual ads. Mm, one second. Right here. Sorry, I have a lot of documents tonight, so sorting through them is a little bit. It's gonna take me a little bit time to remember what should go where.
Okay. So this first one is an insurance company commercial. Share my screen with you. So you can, are you able to hear that? I can see it. That's a, okay. I can see it. Sorry, someone said they can't see it. No, I said I could see it. Okay. จะได้อะไรถ้าเขาทำแบบนี้ทุกวันจะไม่ได้อะไรเลยไม่ได้รวยขึ้นไม่ได้ออกทีวีไม่มีใครรู้จักไม่ได้มีชื่อเสียงที่มากขึ้นสิ่งที่เขาได้คือได้แค่ความรู้สึกได้เห็นความสุขได้เข้าใจได้ความรักได้ในสิ่งที่เงินซื้อไม่ได้ได้โลกที่สวยงามกว่าเดิมในชีวิตคุณอะไรคือสิ่งที่คุณต้องการมากที่สุดภัยประกันชีวิตเชื่อในความดีโอเค Whatever you conceptualize in your groups, uh, if they are able to relate to it on a human level, if they're able to see that in 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 purchasing this product they're not a, only able to meet their needs, but somehow like they're they're uh, making their full potential or meeting their full potential, then they're more likely um, to be persuaded. Right now, we've probably never seen that that tie ad, um, but it it won the award for best. Commercial advertisement in 2004, 2014. All right, all right. 
So let's look at another one. To all the breakers out there, this ad is for you. Here's to those who love to break standing, to those who love to break sitting. Here's to those who break while doing something, and the ones who break by doing nothing. Here's to the confused breaker, the I don't know what to do breaker, the I don't know where to go in my break breaker to the I've been breaking all day long breaker the give me a break from ad breaks breaker the breakaway breaker here's to the one cheek up I always miss my stop the once I start I can't stop breaker here's to the I have no choice but to break breaker what the hell is that behind me breaker the lol 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 breaker the selfie taker the I've got the music in me breaker I'll always be a kid. I like to be silly. I have no clue what I'm doing. Look at me. I can bounce a ball. Breaker. To the old school breaker and to the I'm serious because I'm a man breaker. To all kinds of breakers from the chocolate that loves each and every one of you. Have more breaks. Okay. All right, so which of Maslow's hierarchy of needs, which of the human needs, according to Maslow's hierarchy, does that add, want to tap into? Is that physiological needs, basic needs? What do you mean? Which of the, you mean food and shelter? I mean, rest. Yeah, take a break could be interpreted that way. But why mm -hmm. did they why did they review so many people? Oh. To this one and to the next one. They want people to feel as though they are a part of a group. This is about inclusion. Belong. Belongingness. Yes, Felicia, that's it. So it's belongingness. Um, you're not different from anyone else. People take breaks in different ways. And so this ad appeals to the, the various breakers right everyone needs a break um and it's also very humorous right it kind of it gets us to respond to its humorous content content as well as that need to belong right tapping into that human need to belong all right good um and this one is a compilation of ads, but I want you to try to determine what the message of this ad is, uh, what the message of this compilation is. Greatness, it's just something we made up. Somehow we've come to believe that greatness is a gift reserved for a chosen few, for prodigies, for superstars. And the rest of us can only stand by watching. You can forget that. Greatness is not some rare DNA strand. It's not some precious thing. Greatness is no more unique to us than breathing. We're all capable of it. All of us.
Some people are told they were born with greatness. Some people tell themselves. If greatness doesn't come knocking at your door, maybe you should go knock on its door. Sometimes greatness is about overcoming insurmountable adversity. Sometimes it's just fun. Greatness isn't always measured in tenths of a point. It's a bit bigger than that. Sometimes greatness is something you plan. But most of the time, it's just something you try. It's easy to think greatness is only something you see on TV. Unless, of course, greatness is watching TV. Greatness is a scary thing. Until it isn't. If we think greatness is supposed to look a certain way, act a certain way, and play a certain way, we certainly need to rethink some things. Is it speed or endurance? Does it happen in two hours or four or six? Is it finishing strong or barely finishing? Yes. Is greatness worth fighting for? What do you think? If we face our fears, it means we're pointed in the right direction. Even if that direction is upside down. It's not the biggest stadium in the world. Not the biggest players either. But the pursuit of greatness is kind of big enough, isn't it? You don't need an official court, an official net, or official uniforms to be officially great. Greatness speaks for itself. Once it learns to talk. Greatness needs a lot of things. But it doesn't need an audience. Some measure greatness in precious metals. It's made. If you'd like to tell the guy with the sword he's not great because he's not famous, be my guest. There are no grand celebrations here. No speeches, no bright lights. But there are great athletes. Somehow we've come to believe that greatness is reserved for the chosen few. For the superstar. The truth is, greatness is for all of us. This is not about lowering expectations. 
It's about raising them for every last one of us. Because greatness is not in one special place. And it is not in one special person. Greatness is wherever somebody is trying to find it. Okay, so what need is Nike tapping into with their find your greatness? Self-actualization. So it's not just about being here, but it's about being the best version of yourself, um, reaching your full potential. What is the message of that ad, that, that long compilation? What is the message that we're getting? They're compiling a definition of greatness. Uh, and the, the point is there is no set definition of greatness. Um, it is different things to different people, but the one commonality is that these are not people we would consider great traditionally, right? They're not famous. Um, they're not superstars or professional athletes. Um, a lot of the people featured in this ad have physical disabilities, um, but they're not allowing those disabilities to keep them from achieving their full potential. Right, and so this is an ad that taps into our kind of higher order self, the, the, the notion that or the need for us to feel as though we are reaching our true potential and living up to the, our best version of who we are. All right, good. And now an ad that I found very funny for some reason, but maybe it's my warped sense of humor, but it's a, it's a Heinz commercial ad And I want you to tell me why they chose this particular spokesperson. I've got an idea for a Heinz ketchup commercial. I was at this super posh restaurant, super posh. The type of place that has chandeliers and paintings on the wall and way too many forks. I think classical music was playing, but maybe it was jazz. No, definitely classical. The hostess walks up to me and she says, Mr. Sheeran, is this your first time dining with us? And I say, yep. The waiter comes over, he's telling me about the specials. Super fancy, fancy vegetables, fancy sauces. I said, sounds fancy. So fast forward and the food comes. The waiter goes on to tell me, we are proud to present this farm to table, blah, 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 posh and fancy, blah, 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 with a side, blah, blah, blah. You know, the food looked good. I just thought there was something missing. So I reach into my bag and I take out the only thing that can complete me. And at that point, the whole world came to a stop. way to what's screaming through his eyes. So that's my idea. Do you want to do it? Okay, sorry. I so why use Ed Sharon, a musician, and this is an, uh, an example of brilliant marketing and it kind of just fell into Heinz's lap. But why use Ed Sharon for marketing uh, Heinz ketchup? Because he's a well-known artist. He's um, one, a talented singer, he's well-known yeah. that serves, him in, serves the brand in that way. But also he is the self-proclaimed biggest fan of Heinz ketchup. So much so that he's put a tattoo with the ketchup bottle on his arm. Yeah, and so, yes, and so they have capitalized on his love for Heinz and his celebrity status. And so that's another um, strategy that advertisers use as well. You well-known celebrities endorsing particular products, whether they use the product or not. In this case, because he is so vocal about his love of Heinz ketchup, there's a truth to it that connects with the audience. Um, and that is very appealing. 
Okay. Notice that, that this is an ad that kind of draws on contrast, the way he's dressed in the, um, what do you call him, in the flannel shirt and his language um, in this posh, a very fancy hotel. He's about simplicity um, and hominess, not all about the fancy, all right? And so the ad draws that contrast and appeals to people who are like-minded. All right, good. And so the final one, should be a familiar one to most of us. Well, those of us over the age of 40, I don't know how many of, of us in this class are over the age of 40. So before we even see him, we know that this ad is going to feature rich, well-known Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson from the glittery from the top. top. <laughs> <laughs> You're a whole new generation You're dancing through the day You're grabbing for the magic on the run You're a whole new generation You're loving what to do I put a Pepsi in the motion And that choice is up to you Hey, you're the Pepsi generation Girls are down and there's the Icon, hang on one second. I need, I can't get to it. Let me stop the share. There we go. Um, so how does that ad sell the product? Through using Michael Jackson, but it sends another message. What's the underlying message? How many of you recognize Carlton? Yes, that was Carlton from the Fresh Prince, the little boy yeah. that was dancing. <laughs> Carlton from the Fresh <laughs> um, but what's the underlying message? There's a kind of secret encoding between Michael Jackson and Carlton that's going on, a kind of message being sent. That of a new generation, I guess. Um, so you're kind of passing the baton. This is about inclusion and acceptance, right? Right, right. Um, so you feel a part of something greater, but it's a, so Michael Jackson represents one generation and he's passing the talent on um, to this new generation, which includes, um, Alfonso Ribeiro, right? Otherwise known as Carlton. Um, they are using Michael Jackson, his celebrity status, his music. Oh, I'm sorry. His music to sell a product. So let me put my phone on silent. And the ad is very effective for Michael Jackson's presence alone. Um, Pepsi slogan, the taste of a new generation is actually a way of knocking the competitor. What do I mean by that? Which competitor are they knocking? Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola. So Coca-Cola was invented well before Pepsi and 
Pepsi's take was, or Pepsi's claim to fame was, we will, we we appeal to a younger market. Pepsi was sweeter. Um, they had um, a more hip, more upbeat marketing campaign that used celebrities like Michael Jackson. Most recently, I think they've used one of the uh, Kardashian girls. Um, they've used Cindy Crawford in the past. They appeal to a younger generation, hence their slogan, the taste of a new generation, All right? So they were knocking Coca-Cola, which is more historical, older, not as sweet um, as well. Okay, um, any comments or questions about any of the ads that we looked at or how they tie into Maslow's hierarchy? All right, so I'm gonna share the assignment that you're going to do on screen with you. And I'm gonna give you the opportunity just for another 20 minutes or so to go into groups because before you leave tonight, I'd like to see or at least know what your product is. So that we can have okay. Um, I don't want too much overlap with people creating the same product. So I'm going to give you the opportunity and then come back in the group, tell me what that product is, and we'll um, then move on from there and try to eliminate as much overlap as possible. So let me share the persuasive marketing assignment with you. One second. Okay, so you should be looking at the assignment. Do you see it? So you have to conceptualize a product. Do you see it? Yes. yes. Okay, all right, great. So you're, you're thinking of a product that meets a specific consumer need, and that could be something that you believe would work best in the office, the home, or for personal health and wellness. Um, you will need to divide, devise a, a catchy slogan for that product and to the best of your ability, a rendering of that product. Now, let me just explain. I know that I probably don't have, you know, Picassos in the class. I'm not a Picasso myself. So to the best of your ability, um, whether that's a stick figure, a scratch figure, but a rendering of the product. So some drawing that illustrates what the product is and devise a strategy. So the strategy must outline the effectiveness of your product, who your target audience or market is, and an explanation of how consumers will benefit or why consumers should buy your product. And so your marketing strategy should be about 200 words minimum, All right? Um, this is not due until next week, Wednesday you will be able to present your ideas in class. And then we critique as a group, some of the products and the marketing strategy. And then at the end of the lesson next week, you're going to email that assignment to me for a grade. And there will be, let me see how many of you are in class. Again, at this point, um, let me stop the share. So do. Okay, it looks like we're gonna, Jules is not here. Um, he may have to do this assignment on his own. So I have no choice but to put you in the groups based on who's in the class now. So it means we're gonna get one group, which is not ideal. One group of three and two groups of two. But this group of three, because three people are sharing the work, your product has to be like, wow, I want you to know. I mean, and I, the reason I put you into groups for this assignment is it's really only 5%. Five, 5%. Five it's a lot of work for 5%. Um, and so I want you to kind of share the burden. Okay. 
All right, so I've assigned you to groups. And as I said, I'm gonna give you about 15 minutes just to talk amongst yourselves about a product so that before you leave tonight, you can tell me what you came up with. All right, any questions? All right, so room one, Helga Cummings, Janice Rule, Tanishka Colebrook. Room two, Denise Thompson and Felicia Pratt. Room three, Bernie Bain and Natasha Augustin. So I'm gonna open the rooms and give you about 15 minutes and then close and, and bring you back to the meeting so that you, you can tell me. Now, this means that you're gonna have to dialogue with your partner between now and Wednesday to complete this assignment. So make sure you share your contacts. This is kind of a homework assignment that you'll have to work on together outside of class, okay? Okay. Okay, so let me check on the other students that are still in their groups. Tanishka hasn't joined the meeting. She was in a group with you and Helga, right, Janice? Yes, yes. Okay. Okay. All right. So we all back in the main meeting. So let's hear from room one. What product did you come up with? That's us, right? Yes. Okay. Um, the idea is a bridal keepsake box. Okay. Um, the target audience would be um, brides. Mm-hmm. The purpose is really, to, well, before I get to the purpose, the content of the box would be personalized items. Okay. Um, so you'd have on these items, the name of the bride, uh -huh. the date of the wedding. The contents would be um, a satin robe, a photo candle with uh -huh. um, a photo of the bride and her husband. Okay. Now um, you don't have to tell me your marketing strategy. I just wanted to know the product. Gotcha. Okay. So there you, go. you don't have overlap. So I don't think too many people came up with a bridal keepsake box. Okay. It's an interesting product. Okay, good. Um, group one. Um, group two. Group two is who? Um that's what I say. Okay. I think, yeah, I, think you know, Denise, I didn't make note of the, the room. Sorry. Okay. And I think that's us. So we came up with uh car as our product a car c-a-r okay <laughs> all right okay so you're going to design a new kind of car um design is a very strong word <laughs> it has to be something not already on the market though oh it has to be a brand oh thing. see oh we didn't know all that mm -hmm. So you conceptualize, oh. conceptualize means you create. So you create something that meets this particular need. 
Um, so if you want to go the route of a car, maybe a car that is more eco-friendly. Okay, or... so no, you know what? Mm -hmm. uh, well, our intent was to customize the car. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, like so, so we have a target market that we're okay. focusing on and okay, we're customizing the vehicles. Okay, so these that are has to be order. something revolutionary about your product. Good. All right. Um, and group three? Okay, um, we came up with a bath time body wash and bath sponge. Okay. Um, something that's going to help you to unwind at the end of the day. Okay. And possibly help with um, um, getting the bed. Falling okay, so sleeping. Faster. All right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, so you came up with some interesting products. I'm eager to see how you market these products next week. Um, your slogan and your rendering, what this product is going to look like. And please have it packaged in a way that you can send to me via email. Um, that means you can't share something with me that's been drawn you know, or is on construction paper or something like that. So you have to do it on electronically. Okay. okay. You can have you to draw it and scan it. You can, if you want to do that, you can. Okay. But be, be able to share your product with me. Okay. Electronically. All right. All right. So Thank it, you, ladies. Sorry. To I, have one, I, have, I have one question. So it has to be something that we draw or can it be something that we created, we created and then take a photo? Mm, or a video would be better if you choose to do that, Janice. Okay. Yeah. So use a, your phone to create a video and then you could share that with the class. I'll okay. just make you the host and you share. But if you do that, then your video, um, try what platform would work best in this case? Mm, I think maybe the cell phone would be the best thing to do mm -hmm. um, unless you have a YouTube account and you could upload your video to YouTube because then you don't have server issues. Uh, but just make sure, be aware of space. Okay. In terms right. of you, if you go the video route. Okay, mm -hmm. great. Any other questions? Okay, so this should be interesting. I will see you next week. Somebody have Update a question? Update the register. Okay. Yes. Thank you for reminding me. Um, so Denise, I need to add you as present. And who else came in? Okay. I want something to miss on. Miss Higgs. Okay, great. Um, so there was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Perfect. That's everyone. Go ahead. Um, yeah, yeah. Those of you who don't have a question, sorry. Those of you who don't have a question, you can leave the meeting. If you have a question, just please stay behind. All right, go ahead with your question. Yeah, you know, you just added me to a group. Um, can I get the the the, the work for it, please? I think the assignment is at the bottom of your syllabus. Oh, okay, okay. Yes. So you need to is Helga in your group? Yes, ma'am. So get Helga's contacts. Uh, she and Jules are assigned, and they are already working on. Or they, they should be dialoguing about the product. I mean, is Helga in your group for this assignment tonight? Yes, yeah, she is. Okay, great. So she can tell you how far they've gotten, but that assignment is at the bottom of your syllabus, the video assignment at the end of the semester. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. Okay. 